from Loma Linda University Medical Center and we're going to go over the EFAST scan. So the EFAST stands for Extended Focus Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. So and the main indication is going to be for blunt abdominal trauma in the setting of a motor vehicle accident um, or it can be also in the setting of any other types of trauma such as penetrating trauma. The targeted diagnoses that you're going to be ruling out are hemoperitoneum, fluid in the abdomen, hemothorax, or fluid in the chest, pericardial fusion, fluid around the heart, and collapsed lung, pneumothorax. Regarding the technique, for the ultrasound machine, you want to click the preset button or the exam button, and you want to choose either the fast scan mode or the abdominal mode. The transducer you want to select is going to be either the phase array probe or the curvilinear probe. I prefer the phase array probe, which is this probe here on the left side of the screen. The indicator on the screen should be on the left side of the screen. If you see it over here on the right side of the screen, you're most likely in cardiac mode, and you should make sure you're truly in the abdominal setting. The depth is about 15 to 20 centimeters. The indicator for the FAST scan is generally going to be either towards the patient's head or towards the patient's right side. The indicator goes up towards the patient's head. However, if you have obstructed views because of ribs, you can turn slightly counterclockwise um, to, to minimize the interference of the ribs. The sequence that I use for the FAST scan is the following. I always go right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, pelvis, cardiac, and, and finally pulmonary. The first three images that you are going to look for for the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and pelvis, you're ruling out fluid in the abdomen and as well as the thorax. So first we're going to go over the abdomen. There's multiple dependent spaces that you can have for the abdomen. However, depending on if you're having upper versus lower GI bleed, the fluid is going to attract initially in different areas. So if you had a lower GI bleed, you might not see fluid in Morrison's pouch until later. However, if you had a liver laceration, then you might see fluid in Morrison's pouch first. Here are the different abdominal views. First is the right upper quadrant. So the landmarks of the right upper quadrant, you're going to place your probe in the mid axillary line at the 10th rib space. And the inner indicator is up towards the patient's head. So here is what you're going to see with the right upper quadrant view. And here are the different landmarks. So the first thing you're going to see from head to toe or from superior to inferior is the lung, diaphragm, liver, Morse's pouch, and then the right kidney. You notice that the lung is, has something called what we call a mirror image artifact. You can see that a little bit better in this image where you see the liver, here's the kidney, here's the spine shadows, and here you see the diaphragm, and above that is a mirror image artifact, which looks like liver. This is because ultrasound waves pass through the liver, hit this very dense diaphragm, and then the waves get scattered by all the air in the lungs and get reflected straight back to the probe and it makes it look like there's ectopic liver above the diaphragm. This is completely normal, indicative of lung above the diaphragm, aerated lung actually above the diaphragm. Another thing you can see is the spine gets cut off and you don't see the spine past this because there's lung that refracts air and you don't see the spine. If you do see the spine, you might have a fluid above the chest. So you also notice that the patient, when the patient breathes in and out, that affects their views also. So remember to fan the probe to make sure you're not missing any pockets of fluid. And also look for the right uh, inferior portion of the kidney as well as the liver tip to make sure you're, you're not missing any fluid at the tip. Regarding the acoustic windows, the liver is pretty big, so it's very difficult to not see Morrison's pouch on the right side. However, when you're scanning the left side, the spleen is fairly small and you still need to use that as an acoustic window. So make sure that for the left upper quadrant, you have the knuckles on the bed because the spleen is fairly posterior and you're going to be at the posterior axial land around the 8th intercostal space. This is what you're going to see. Similar to the liver view, you're going to see left lung, which is superior, then diaphragm, then spleen, and then left kidney. What's important to note is that fluid tracks around the perisplenic space and it doesn't track between the spleen and the kidney like Morrison's pouch. And this is because there's a splenorenal ligament between the spleen and the kidney and unless you rupture that ligament you won't see fluid between the spleen and the kidney. Here's a normal view of the left upper quadrant. And sometimes it's difficult to see the perisplenic space or the space between the diaphragm and the kidney without having the patient breathe. So this patient has an a rib obstructing your, the view, so just have the patient breathe in 
and you can once again then you can see the diaphragm and the space between the spleen and the kidney. Here's some abnormal images. So remember, fluid is black. We're really trying to just rule in or rule out any types of abdominal fluid. So here's a patient with a small amount of free fluid here in between the liver and the kidney. Here's a patient with fluid at the liver edge, this anechoic area here. However, you don't see fluid in Morrison's pouch. This patient most likely has a lower abdominal bleeding source. <clears throat> and here's a patient with a large amount of free fluid in the abdomen. For the left upper quadrant, here's a patient with a spleen, kidney, here's a diaphragm. You see this anechoic area around the spleen indicative of free fluid in the left upper quadrant. Here's a, another view where this is the spleen and here is a small amount of fluid between the spleen and the diaphragm. And once again, you don't see fluid between the spleen and the kidney. It's really between the diaphragm and the spleen. Here's some examples of false positives. So here's a gallbladder and here is an IVC. <coughs> so if you fan through this image, you'll see that this is gallbladder, IVC, and aorta all in one view. So make sure that when you're calling a positive exam, it's, these aren't the structures that you're actually looking at. For the pelvic view, you're going to go for the suprapubic and either longitude or transverse views, and they're going to be the indicators being towards the head and the right, uh, respectively. Make sure the patient has a full bladder and try to perform the exam before Foley's place to make sure you have a good acoustic window using the bladder. The longitudinal view is in general going to be better than your transverse view and easier to interpret. So here's an example of a male pelvis. The two structures you want to identify are the bladder and the prostate. And here is an example of the indicator up towards the patient's head. And here's a bladder, here's a prostate. And if you transpose that to the ultrasound screen, this is what you see. Where you're really looking for fluid is just to the left of this prostate and bladder in the retrovesicular space. <coughs> so here's the retrovesicular space in the diagram. If you draw a line right where the prostate is and just look to the left of that, that's where you're going to see your free fluid. So once again, the line is drawn right at the prostate and the bladder, and to the left of that is your retrovesicular space. Here's a transverse view of the male pelvis. I would once again really focus on the longitudinal views if possible. Here's a normal male longitudinal view where this is the bladder prostate and here's a retrovesicular space with all the bowel gas over here scattering the ultrasound waves. Here's some abnormal male pelvis views. Remember, fluid is black. So here's the bladder and here is fluid just to the left of that bladder and prostate. Black anechoic area. Here is bowel peristalsing. Here's another view where you see bladder, bowel, bowel peristalsing, and this is free fluid just to the left of that bladder and prostate here. Here's another view with a bladder, and here is anechoic fluid, indicative of free fluid in the abdomen. Here's a transverse view where you see here is a bladder, here is a prostate, and if you look closely to the sides right here, you'll see anechoic areas right here, indicative of free fluid. Here's a patient with a Foley that was placed, and you can see here, here's free fluid just to the left of that bladder, and here is a Foley right here. So just to recap, remember to locate the prostate and look to the left of that prostate and that bladder for the retrovesicular space. For the females, you're going to look at the retrouterine space or the pouch of Douglas. And if you, once again, indicators up towards the patient's head for a longitudinal view, here's a bladder, here's a uterus, and when you transpose that, this is what you see. You really want to focus on that retrouterine space or that space right posterior to the uterus. Here's a transverse view of the female pelvis. There's a bladder, uterus, and retrouterine space. And once again, you're looking for fluid right be behind or underneath that uh, uterus. And this is a normal patient with no free fluid there. Here's some abnormal views where you see here is the uterus, here is the bladder, and here is that anechoic area right below the uterus indicative of free fluid. Here's another view, a transverse view. This is the bladder, here is the uterus, and here you can actually see a small amount of free fluid lying posterior to that. So how much free fluid? If you see a thin stripe that corresponds to about 250 cc's or about one unit of packed red blood cells, and 0.5 centimeters is 500 cc's and one centimeter is about one liter of fluid. The next view you want to get to make sure is you want to make sure while you're doing the left upper quadrant and right upper quadrant views is to rule out hemothorax. So the views that you're getting already, you're just looking right above that diaphragm and looking for the lung space right above that. So here's a right upper quadrant view 
you look above that diaphragm for free fluid. Here's a left upper quadrant view. Look above that left upper quadrant, uh, left, left diaphragm for free fluid. And here's a patient with a right hemothorax. And once again, we talked about that spine sign. See that spine passing the diaphragm and the anechoic area here? That's indicative of fluid in the chest. Here's a large amount of fluid in the chest here. Add a lactatic lung over here. And here is the diaphragm over here. Here's a patient with both a hemothorax up here. This is the diaphragm, and here is perisplenic fluid or fluid in the abdomen. So you can also rule out pericardial effusion and tamponade. It might be confusing between the standard view and the cardiology view. The cardiology view, the indicator is towards the right shoulder, but since you're using a standard view, you're going to rotate your indicator 180 degrees, and now the indicator is going to go towards the left hip. If you don't remember these things, you can always do the three L's to success. So the parasitic long axis view, the left ventricle, is always on the left side of the screen. If you see an image that looks like this with the ventric left ventricle on the right side of the screen, all you do is just turn your probe 180 degrees and you'll get the correct image orientation. Here's a patient with a parasternal long axis view. Here's a pericardial fusion. And here's a right ventricle with tamponade with diastolic collapse of the RV. For the sub xiphoid view, the cardiac view, you will have the indicator towards the patient's left. However, in the fast scan view, you're going to have the indicator towards the patient's right side. And this is the view you're going to get. So here's the patient with a pericardial fusion, and here's the patient that has RV diastolic collapse or tamponade. Then you're going to rule out pneumothorax. This is the last thing you're going to rule out. And the, what you're looking for is lung sliding. The indicator, you can either use a phase array probe or a linear probe. I would recommend using the phase array probe if you can because you're already using that for the other images. The indicator is going to be going towards up towards the patient's head at the second intercostal space. And you're going to look for the rib shadows as well as this, uh, this hyperechoic line or for that corresponds to the pleural space. What you're looking for is what looks like ants marching in a line. So this patient here, here's the pleural line. And you can see that as the patient breathes in and out, the visceral and parietal pleura slide against each other and cause it to look like ants marching on a line. If you see this, this absolutely rules out pneumothorax in that area. If you see another image that looks like this, however, you see that when the patient's breathing in and out, you don't see any lung sliding. It's just only parietal pleura. There's no visceral pleura adjacent to it, so there's no lung sliding that's observed, no ants marching. You can also use M-mode or motion mode, where you put an M-mode cursor, this cursor right here, across the lung pleura, and you look for if there's any lung sliding here or this grainy appearance down here. So what you're looking for is a sky ocean beach sign, right? So the beach is basically sandy uh, beach, which corresponds to lung sliding. However, if you don't see good lung sliding, you'll see what looks like this or the barcode sign because there's no lung sliding. It doesn't pick up any of that sandy appearance past that pleural line. So things to look out for is subcute emphysema. If there's air in this tissue, you might not see uh, your images because the ultrasound can't get past that. Any abdominal free air, um, you might not be able to see good images in your uh, for ruling out hemoperitoneum. Obese patients might be difficult, and patients with ascites obviously already have free fluid in their abdomen, so you might have to perform a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. So the EASE practice guidelines recommends that the FAST may be used as an initial diagnostic modality. However, just be really cautious because in all stable patients, um, they, a CT scan is indicated in them, and you should never delay a FAST scan or a CT scan should never delay a CT scan in order to get a FAST scan done because the CT scan is much more definitive than the FAST scan. However, in the setting of an unstable patient, a positive FAST scan really dictates management and can really locate the site of bleeding because the patient is too unstable to go to CT scan. So just in summary, here's some misconceptions. Remember to always get all your views. One view is not adequate. FAST does not rule out injury, okay? It only rules that, that there's fluid in the abdomen, but it doesn't rule out the actual injury or doesn't show you where the injury is. Fast is always needed, that's not true, right? You make sure you can get a CT scan if the patient's stable. Full bladder is not necessary, that's not true either. You really want to make sure you have a full bladder when you're scanning. So the sequence, one again, is once again, is the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant. Make sure you're ruling out fluid in the chest and abdomen in these two views. The pelvis, the cardiac ruling out pericardial fusion, tamponade, and lastly, looking at the lungs, rule out pneumothorax.